All right, hello once again. This is Jeff Scott of Blackhawk Technical College. I've been going over the PowerPoint presentations for the Murox MySQL text that will be used for the online version of 152-147 Relational Database Development for the Spring 2016 semester. The plan is to go over the first 12 chapters in PowerPoints and then go over the first 12 chapters also as far as the assignment because that's as far as in the book, I mean, because uh, chances are pretty good that's I'm going to give homework through the first 12 chapters and that's it. Now, if I come up with time, I will lecture, I'll go over the PowerPoints only for the last six or seven chapters of the book, if I have time. Okay, so let's get going. This is chapter four, how to retrieve data from two or more tables, which is going to involve what is referred to in Relational Database Technology, or RDBMS, as a join. So first we'll talk about an inner join, because those are the ones that are done most often. All right, so we'll talk about um, how to do an inner join. And you can do an inner join on as many tables as you need to, including just one table. So you can join a table onto itself, <clears throat> which is called a self-join. After we get done talking about inner joins, we'll talk about outer joins. And uh, then we'll talk a little bit about unions. Explain why you have to qualify names at certain times. Talk about using aliases discuss the differences between the different join types and also discuss using the natural and the using keywords as well. <clears throat> so this is an example and I, what I want to do is concentrate for right now on this example right here. Okay, so what you have to imagine right now is we have two tables. One table is called invoices and one table is called vendors and we need a piece of information from each table from the vendors table we need the vendors name and from the invoice table we need the invoice number all right luckily for us the vendor name or vendor has got a primary key that's called vendor ID and we've added that vendor ID as a foreign key in our invoices table and that vendor ID is the field that we can join on so what we're saying here in this inner join is records that you find that have the same or the particular ID vendor ID in both tables for those cases give me both the invoice number and the vendor name so in other words what this is going to do is this is going to give me all of the invoice numbers all right, for which there is a vendor. <clears throat> and they show you the syntax right here. I will tell you, this is what's referred to as the newer type of syntax. Later on in the chapter, I know in the book, and I'm not sure if they show it on the uh, slides here or not, so we'll find that out in a bit. But um, I do know that in the book, they talk about the older type of join, and that's the way that I learned. But you know, you be, be feel free to use either way. So, <clears throat> so if we look at this example right here, all right, it's not the same same one that we just looked at, but it is similar. But what I do want to mention is this. <clears throat> all right. Notice what we've done here is we've prefaced, okay? So instead of saying vendor, vendors.vendor ID and invoices.invoice.vendor .invoice .vendor ID, invoices .vendor .id .vendor .id, we now say v.vendor ID and i.vendor ID. We can do that because up here we alias the table names. We said what we want to be able to do now is we want to be able to refer, instead of writing out vendors, we just want to write out v. And instead of writing out invoices, we just want to write out I. Now, what we could say here, if we wanted to, even though we haven't defined it all the way till down here, 
we could say select I dot invoice number comma V dot vendor name comma I dot invoice due date comma I dot invoice total minus and then I'm not sure where this one is probably on the invoice I dot payment total minus again probably I dot credit total as balance due from this <clears throat> And you don't have to, in, to alias all tables. In this example, they've only aliased one table. <clears throat> I mean, again, did you have to do that? The answer is no. You never have to alias your tables. But sometimes by doing that, it just results in a lot less typing for you to do. That's all. All right. So notice what they're doing here, and in fact, in particular, take a look at what's in the yellow on the screen, because what they're doing is they're grabbing information from the customer's table, but the key point is that customer's table, which they're going to alias as C, is from another database. I believe it's this is the AP database we're using, but that customer's table is from the OM database. And we can do it because notice that both fields, or both tables, have a zip code. And as long as that zip code is set up the same, all right, the same data type, and, and ideally at least the same size, you'll be able to do that. Even though one is in one database, and one table is in one database, and the other table is in another database. Do you do that a lot? It, it Again, as always, it depends on the circumstances. So if we look right here, all right, notice that we've got two different tables. We've got a customer's table, and we've got an employee's table, all right? And notice that we have there is no customer ID in both tables. There is no employee ID in both tables. But we've got a last name field and a first name field in both tables. It looks like what we want to do here is we want to look through our customers table to find out which customers, which of these 24 customers are also employees. So what you'll notice is what we're saying is from the customer table we want the first name and last name all right and we want to join the customers table on the employees table based on both the first name and last name so in other words show me a person from both tables with the same first name and the same last name all right so here it looks like Thomas Hardy is the only customer who is also an employee. So you see Thomas Hardy there, and you can't see him here, but we'll have to just suppose that he's here as well. All right. Now here's a self-join. This one is a little trickier. All right, sometimes the information is in one table, but in order to get that information, you've got to really, really look hard. <clears throat> so as it says, this self-join, so it's a table that's joined on itself, returns vendors from cities in common with other vendors. So in other words, if you look on here, you've got three vendors in Phoenix, two vendors in California, in, An or in Anaheim, and three vendors in Fresno from what we can see on the screen. The key point here is notice what we're doing is everything that we're looking for is from vendors. All right, and we are actually aliasing both. The original vendors is V1, the other one is V2. 
and modus on vendor one dot city equal vendor two dot city and state equal state and name not equal to one another. So in other words, show me an occasion where you have a vendor, different vendors who reside in the same city and the same state. And really, it looks a little bit tricky, and I guess it is a little bit tricky, but it's an interesting query. A lot of times when you're getting these queries, you get them for different people. You know, one of the things you can do with queries, at least at times, is kind of kind of like you um, used to do more with spreadsheets, and that is play some what-if type of analysis. A lot of times what you find is the people who want the actual um, query information are people from marketing or maybe even management. Okay. Here is a statement that joins four tables. The key thing to realize is we have three join statements. So there will always be one less join statement than the number of tables that you're joining. So if, if, if you are joining two tables, there's one join. Three tables, there's two joins. Or like this one, four tables. All right, there are three joins. Now, what's nice about doing this is the fact that occasionally you will want information and there may be 20, 30, 50, 100 different tables in the same database and the data may be there but you may have to join a lot of tables in order to get the data that you need. So it looks like here we're joining the invoice table, the vendor table, the general ledger, accounts table, and the invoice line items table. Now the other way that you can do this is the way that I learned and that's what they're showing right here. So take a look. I find this easier but you know you really sh it's, it's recommended that you use the newer way because that's a way that's actually been designed to work with this but the way I've done it I've done it like this for years and I've never really had any problems with it. So let's take a look at the example that's in the middle of your screen here on this slide. Again, from the vendors table, we want the vendor name. From the invoice table, we want the invoice number. But now, instead of writing out inner join, we just say where, where the vendor ID from the vendors table is equal to the vendor ID in the invoices table. So we get the same results here that we did a long time ago for the 114 rows, wherever that was, right here. Way back in slide four, 114 rows, 0258, 0260, etc. 0258, 0260. So it's the same information, you're just going about it a little different way. Here's the same query that we did previously with four tables. Again, I find this easier to read, but the recommendation by MySQL is that you do it the new way as opposed to the old fashioned way. Um, I, I don't like to be a hard guy and dictate the way you do things, so you could actually do it either way as far as I'm concerned. All right, so terms to know. Join, again, the ability to combine information from one or more tables together to find information you could not find otherwise. A join condition, what you're joining on. An inner join, when you're finding stuff that literally is going to exist in both tables. Ad hoc relationship, I'm not even sure exactly what they mean by that. So, qualified column name, all right. So, in other words, if, if you've got, if, if you want to, um, one of the things that you want to select is a column that's common in, bo in more than one table, you have to qualify that to let the system know which table you're pulling it out of. Schema, we've already talked a little bit about. All right, 
and again that's the way that the table is set up the kind of the behind the scenes under the hood type of stuff self join where you're joining some a, a table on itself explicit syntax which is the newer syntax that I mentioned to you and implicit syntax which is the last one that they just showed here all right everything we've looked at thus far has is related to what are what is referred to as an inner join and that's things that exist in both tables you can also do an outer join all right so if I do a left outer join between two tables the one I mentioned first returns everything even if there aren't matches in the one on the right if I do a right outer join it returns everything from the second table even if there are no matches in the first table all right so here's an example of one and you'll notice it's vendors and invoices so these are vendors and you'll notice that four of the five vendors shown on the screen here do not have invoices but it's saying show me all vendors regardless of whether or not they have invoice numbers and invoice totals if we didn't do this as an outer join those wouldn't be mentioned because they wouldn't have matches another example here with a departments table and employees table and you'll notice they've got a manager ID here and you can tell by looking Cindy Smith all right does not have a manager ID so what does that mean well it could mean that Cindy doesn't report to anybody So we've got three tables here, and there's a projects table. So it looks like what they have here, what they're looking for, is they want to show every single department name and number and the last name. of every employee who works in every department and you'll notice it looks as though looking at this there's no one who works for operations again there's a left outer join when everything comes from department number all right and basically on the employees show me it even if it's no and then we do it the other way where show me all the last names even if those people don't have department names associated with them so there's five department numbers but you'll notice the two people work for department six which does not have a department name it's got a number associated with it evidently but not a name all right then they do the same thing with three tables using both a left in a right okay you can combine an outer and an inner join so again why would you want to do that because remember you it sounds like if you if you combine these you know it's like why are you doing that because you want to get all the information even if in the, like in this case there's no project number so it looks as though in these departments these are the people working there and these are the projects that they're working on so it looks as though Hardy is not working on a project and Jones is not working on a project now there are some shortcuts that you can use on this so if you notice on here on the example the, the, the second example here on the slide it says select invoice number comma vendor name from vendors join invoices using vendor ID so if the field name that you're joining on is exactly the same all right 
then you don't have to have a big condition where you say basically invoices dot vendor ID equals vendors dot and vend vendor ID. And you'll get the same information. So it's a little bit of a shortcut. All right. And you can do it for more than two tables as well. There's also a natural join when if there's only one field in common between the two tables and it's got the same name, you can let the basically you're letting SQL figure out what to join on. So what you've seen here when you take a look at these examples is sometimes three or four different ways of doing the same join. And again, where you are in, in your history here, or where you are at BTC right now, the one you should use is the one that makes the most sense to you. I, I used to always give assignments where I'd say, well, do this and do it four ways. But I, I don't know if that's a good thing or not a good thing. All right. All right. A cross join is also known as a Cartesian product join. And that says, show me every possible combination. Okay. And normally when you do a cross join, whether you do it like this or you do it like this, it's done by accident. Let me give you an example. Okay. A few years ago, I was working with a gentleman who no longer works at Blackhawk, Doug Tavid, and Doug had created a um, database, and that database had in it, I believe it was 6,308 records. All right, and I don't want to do that. But there was at least one student who one day joined that database that joined uh, the table I should say had 6,000 I think it was 6,388 somehow that sticks in my mind so 6,388 records in a table they joined that table on itself and notice what you get then 40,806,544 records all right that was definitely a mistake so the person did their query, and they were sitting in the back of the room, and their machine was turned toward away from me, basically, so I couldn't see it. And they did the, started the query up near the beginning of class, and it was still running when class was over. Why? Well, it did the query like that. But for the system to literally spew out and print out 40, 40 million records, as you'd imagine, took quite a bit of time we end up eventually just stopping the query. So not always, but quite often, when you end up doing a uh, Cartesian product or a cross join, it's done by accident. So again, an outer join, be it left or right, it's saying that you want to match every record in one of the two tables, even if there's no match in the other. Here it's match all the ones on the left, even if there's no matches on the right. Here it's match all the one on the right, even if there's none on the left. <clears throat> an equijoin is, is an inner join what we've been working on previously when you're working with equality. The natural join, again, is a shortcut, which we talked about. The cross join and Cartesian products, not always, but quite often, are mistakes. All right? You can also write a union. And there's a lot of different ways that you can write unions, but sometimes what I want to do is, let's say, for example, that I had two tables. All right, and one was maybe the employees who worked at one plant, and one were employees who worked at the other plant. All right, and I've set up two two different tables, one for each uh, plant, but they're set up exactly the same: first name, last name, etc. All the all the goodies. So I can say basically, select star from the first table, union, select star from the second table. All right. Each result set must have the same, so each table must have the same number of columns. They must have compatible data types. And the column names are taken from the first select clause that are shown up there. So here's an example. We've got two different types of customers. We've got active customers and paid customers. So you'll notice that we're grabbing some stuff from active and some stuff from paid. 
but it is separated. It's not all active together followed by paid or vice versa because we're ordering it by the invoice total. So that's what we're doing the ordering on. <clears throat> you can also go through one table and do a union based on what's in one table. But again, typically when you do that, you're going to have some kind of a where clause as they show right here. You can do a union in, and you can combine as many tables together as you want to or need to combine together. You can do a union that simulates a full outer join. Again, you say, well, if I'm doing that, you know, because I've got a left joint in here and a right joint in here, would you want to do that? Well, again, remember the advantage of doing this is with that left join, you're going to get things from the departments table. All right. Whether or not there is a match in the employees table. And you're also going to get, looking at the union on the bottom, things from the employees table, even if there's not a match on the department's table. And there is the example. So you notice you get nulls in this case, some nulls in all, in all four of the columns. All right. And that's pretty much it for this chapter. Again, when we go through the examples, we'll have a lot, and I mean a lot more. Oops, sorry about that to say about this, okay? And what I wanted to do was bring up the next chapter, which will be on how to code summary queries. Notice there's only 19 slides. It'll be a shorter chapter, even though I will go back in again uh, and take a look at uh, some actual examples of this, okay? So we'll be back to do that shortly.